Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. A fundamental phenomenon in probability and statistics is that sums or averages of independent quantities tend to have a Gaussian distribution. This is why the Gaussian parametric model is used so commonly in many applications. This phenomenon is known as the central limit theorem and we use it for example to build confidence intervals. In this video we're going to study the distribution of sums and averages of independent quantities in order to try to understand why they look Gaussian-like. Let's get to it. We're going to study sums and averages of independent random variables, since random variables is what we use to represent uncertain quantities, and specifically we want to study the distribution and understand why eventually it becomes Gaussian. We're going to begin with a simple example where we're trying to model the number of points gained by a soccer team in a league where they're playing different teams. We're going to have a very simple model where we assume that the points gained in the different games are independent and they all have the same distribution. The probability that the team gains zero points in a game is always 0 0.3. The probability, that looks kind of weird, the probability that the team gains one point is zero, so 0 0.3 that they lose and they gain zero points, 0 0.3 that they tie and they gain one point, and 0 0.4 that they win and they gain three points. I think in most soccer leagues right now, you gain either zero, one, or, or three points. Okay, and the games are independent. We want to characterize the distribution of the number of points that the team wins over n games. This is represented by this random variable s, which is the sum of x1, x2 up to xn. Let's begin by considering just two games. So we have the sum the s2, which is the sum of x1 and x2. I want to characterize its probability mass function. Here I would recommend that you stop the video and try to derive this by yourself, but of course, you know, you do whatever you want. Okay, so what is the PMF of S2 at 0? It's just the probability that S2 is equal to 0. What is S2? It's just the sum of x1 plus x2. How can that sum be equal to 0? Where only if x1 is 0 and x2 is also 0. So this is just equal to the event that they're both 0 at the same time. And now by independence, that's just the product of the individual events. And we know these probabilities. It's the PMF of x1 at 0 and the PMF of x2 at 0, they're both 0 0.3, so the probability that the sum is equal to 0 is 0 0.09. Now let's take a look at what happens for the value 1, which is a little bit more interesting. So again, we want the probability that the sum is equal to 1, but now there's two ways in which the sum can be equal to 1, right? The first game can be 0 and the second 1, and the second game so the first game can be 1 and the second 0. These two events are disjoint because the first game cannot have two outcomes, two different results at the same time, and the same for the second game. So we can write their, the probability of their union as the sum of the probabilities. And now for each of these individual probabilities, we can apply independence again and just express these individual probabilities as a product of the probabilities of the result of each of the games. So we have arrived at this formula, which gives um, the probability of the sum as sum of products of probabilities. And we're going to see that this generalizes. In this case, each of these probabilities is equal to 0 0.3. So the sum is equal to 0 0.18. Now let's take a look at the more general case where we have two random variables a and b. And a can take values in this set and b can take values in this set, their ranges. We're interested in the PMF of the sum of the two random variables. So we follow exactly the same procedure that we followed uh, right now, which was to say, okay, we want the probability that the sum is equal to S. What does that mean? That means that A plus B have to be equal to this constant. And now we have different possibilities, right? For each of the possible values of A, we have to check the probability that A is equal to that value. And at the same time, B is equal to s minus a, because then their sum is going to be equal to s. We, uh, notice that we can sum this because all of these are disjoint events. Now we apply independence and we get a sum 
of products, as in our example. We can now plug in the PMFs and we get this expression, which is a sum of the product of the first PMF times the second PMF, but realize that the second PMF, we have changed its argument to S minus A, which essentially what we mean is we're like kind of flipping it and shifting it by S. Okay, so that's what this, this actually does. In the case where the discrete random variables take integer values, we can write this expression more easily by just making A go over all possible integer values. And uh, this is going to be equivalent because for the ones that it cannot take, the probability is just going to be equal to zero. And otherwise the expression is the same. You might identify this expression as the convolution of this PMF and this PMF. The convolution is written as an asterisk like this, and it's this operation where for a fixed value of s, what you do is you take a function, in this case a discrete function, and you overlay it with another shifted function, and then you take the sum of the product. That's called a convolution. What if we have more than two random variables? We have n random variables that are independent. Then if we consider their sum, we can easily write their sum as the first random variable plus the rest. Oops, not from one, right? From two to n. So now we would have by our result that the PMF of this thing is just the PMF of this guy convolved with the PMF of this guy. But what is the PMF of this guy? Well, this guy we can write as a two plus the sum of the rest. So the PMF of the second term is just going to be the PMF of this guy convolved with the PMF of that guy. And we can continue this argument on and on to show that our result for two variables essentially implies that when we compute the PMF of the sum of n random variables, essentially what we're doing is we're convolving their PMFs. Okay, where convolution again is this um, convolution is this operation here where we're summing over the product of one of the PMFs times the other one but shifted. Let's take a look visually at the effect of a repeated convolution in the case of our example. This is the PMF for one game. This is the PMF for two games. Notice that we computed this value, which was 0 0.09, and this value, which was 0 0.18. And then we, we got tired and we went to the general expression. And when we continue uh, convolving this with the PMF for one game over and over and over, the effect is very interesting. Essentially, realize that we're doing some kind of weighted average, right? When we convolve with this guy, we're taking this guy and kind of shifting it around on top of on top of this and taking these weighted averages. That has a smoothing effect. That little by little, this is for four games, five games, six games, seven games, eight games, smooths out the distribution into something that looks very Gaussian-like. In fact, let's take a look at what happens if we try to fit this PMF using a Gaussian. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to take a Gaussian that has the same mean and the same variance, and we're going to put it on top and see how that looks. What is the mean of a sum of random variables by linearity of expectation? It's just the sum of the means. And for the PMF of the points, the, the mean is actually 1.5. So this would be 1.5 times n. What is the variance of a sum of independent random variables? Here it's critical that the random variables are independent. It's just the sum of their variances. And the variance for our PMF happens to be 1.65 uh, times, times n because we're summing over n. Okay, so it's 1.65. Now we're going to see what happens if we overlay a Gaussian with this mean and this variance on top of the PMF of the sum of n random variables with the distribution um, in our example. So obviously at the beginning, the Gaussian approximation is not great, but as we convolve and convolve and convolve and convolve, 
eventually the Gaussian approximation is actually very good. And here is the first time that we see the central limit theorem in action, and we see that the approximation becomes really good for a very small number of games, which is why later on we're going to use Gaussian approximations in practice, even though the central limit theorem only talks about convergence when n goes to infinity. Let's take a look at what happens with continuous quantities. For this, we're going to look at an example, a made-up example, where there's this cafe, for example, maybe here in Manhattan, that is worried about their coffee supply because they have um, you know, some suppliers, but for each supplier, the quantity that they're going to be able to sell them, the coffee supply that they're going to be able to sell them, is very uncertain because of the political situation in that particular region or because of the weather, etc. Okay, so the way we model this is that from each supplier, the quantity of coffee is actually very uncertain. It's uniform between zero and one ton, depending on um, yeah, weather and the political situation. The total available coffee from N suppliers is just the sum of the supplies from the, the possible supply from each of them. What the cafe decides to do is to say, okay, let me you know, avoid risk by just buying 1 over n times the total supply. And in this way, you know, they could buy from a single supplier, but that would be very risky. This way we kind of like distribute the risk and we'll be fine. So now we're going to try to understand what is the distribution of this average of a coffee supply that the, um, the cafe ends up buying. And by the way, this is a toy example, but it's also a very good example of how people try to avoid risk in practice either when they're, in, they're buying supplies or also when they're investing. And this is also kind of the, the same logic that insurances apply, insurers apply when they insure many different people. Here, the independence assumption is obviously key because if the, all the supplies are zero at the same time, then we're going to have a problem. All right, let me stop rambling and get to it. We're going to analyze the distribution of two suppliers to begin with, in particular, the total um, coffee obtained from two suppliers. These are continuous quantities because we're modeling the supply as being continuous between 0 and 1. So we want the PDF of the sum of the two suppliers. But as always, we're going to start with the CDF because that has a more intuitive interpretation in terms of probabilities. Is the probability that the sum is more equal to a certain constant. What, how, how you know, can the two, the sum be smaller than a certain constant? Well, how, how do we find that probability? We integrate the joint PDF over this region. What do I mean by that? Well, we integrate A from minus infinity to infinity. Here I'm using A and B just to make notation a little bit easier for uh, the variable corresponding to C1 and to C2, which again are the supplies of the first provider and the second provider. Uh, a is going to go from minus infinity to infinity, and now we have to take care so that B only goes up until S minus A. So these are all the values for which A plus B are smaller or equal to S. Hopefully that makes sense. Why do we have a product here? We have a product there because the two random models are independent, so their joint PDF is equal to the product of their individual PDFs. Okay, great. So now we realize that here we're in like this guy is not being integrated with respect to B. So if we integrate this guy from minus infinity to S minus A, we get the CDF of C2 just by definition at S minus A, because that's the probability that um, C2 is more or equal to S minus A. This is an expression for the PDF that we're interested in. Let's go ahead and differentiate it. When we go ahead and differentiate it, we realize that we're differentiating a quantity that has a limit because this is an improper integral that goes from minus infinity to infinity. I don't want to get too much into the details, but it's okay to interchange this differentiation operator and the limit because everything is bounded and everything converges, basically. And because of that, we can put in the um, differentiation operator and we can also put it into the integral for the same reason. Everything um, converges, everything is bounded. In case you're a mathematician and you're worried about this, and now we can just differentiate this guy, which is the only one that depends on S. The derivative is really easy. It's just the density of C2 at S minus A. So now we have this expression for the 
probability density function of the sum in terms of the probability density function of the two random variables that we're summing. And this expression looks very similar to the one that we obtained in the discrete case. Of course, we have an integral instead of a sum, which tends to happen when we're dealing with continuous random variables instead of discrete random variables. And we have PDFs instead of PMFs, but otherwise it looks very similar. We have one of the PDFs that is fixed, and then we have a kind of flipped, shifted version of the other PDF. I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll show you in a moment exactly what I mean by that. But first, let's look at the general formula. This, is, this can be derived in exactly the same way we just derived the one for C1 and C2 by just replacing C1 and C2 by A and B. So in general, if we have two independent continuous random variables and we want the PDF of their sum, the PDF of their sum is going to equal to this expression, which is a continuous convolution between the first PDF and the second PDF. This is how we define the convolution operator for continuous functions. By the same logic that we applied in the discrete case, if we have n random variables, their sum, the PDF of their sum is just going to be equal to the convolution of all the individual PDFs. Now let's take a look at what this convolution looks like for our example where we have these two suppliers. So here we're integrating the product of these two quantities, so we should take a look at where these two quantities are actually non-zero because otherwise this whole product is going to be zero. Right. So the first one is very easy. Just by definition, we know that the supply of coffee is uniform between 0 and 1. So this guy is non-zero when A is between 0 and 1. This guy is also non-zero when whatever argument it has is between 0 and 1. In this case, the argument is S minus A. So this is going to be non-zero if A is smaller than S and if A is greater than S minus 1. Here I want to draw a picture because it's easy to get lost with all of these uh, equations. So let me draw a picture. This kind of brings me back because I was an electrical engineering major in undergrad many years ago, and uh, they used to torture us, making us compute convolutions and convolutions and convolutions, which are very tricky. Um, I have to say that, you know, this, I find this only mildly interesting. I don't think it's a, you know, you should kind of do a couple of them and then be done with it and understand also the effect of a convolution and why when you apply it many, many times, it kind of leads to a Gaussian. But, you know, being able to do convolutions very, very well, I don't think has served me that much in, in my life. Okay, so let me stop rambling. Uh, we have that, this is the, what I'm drawing here is the PMF of C1. It's non-zero, this is A. Um, it's non-zero between 0 and 1. And now what I was saying is that if we look at this other guy, let's say that S is between 0 and 1, then basically... <laughs> terrible picture. Let me try to draw an actual rectangle, Let's see if I can. Okay, perfect. Then F of C2 is non-zero between S minus 1 and S. Okay, so as you can see already, basically when we integrate, we're going to be integrating, let me use a different color, this. So this is basically, the integral is going to be equal to S. If S, so if, hopefully this makes it clear that if S happens to be let's say here instead, then we would see this guy would be here and the product would be zero. There are no values for which they're both non-zero. If S is here though, something else happens. Let me draw, like if S is here, this is really challenging my artistic skills, which are not great. I can, I'll leave it like that so you can laugh at me. Here, S minus 1 to S. So imagine that F of C2 is uh, there instead. Um, in this case, the integral is going to be from S minus 1 to 1. Okay. Um, so the value, 
let me get this right, is going to be 1 minus s minus 1, it's going to be uh, 2 minus s, if I haven't done anything wrong. So hopefully it's clear, let me, it's clear that we're basically taking the PMF, it's clear, I don't know if it's clear or not, but what I'm trying to explain to you is that we're taking this PMF of C2 and we're kind of dragging it along. You might remember from a couple of minutes ago that I talked about like kind of flipping it. Here there's no need to flip it because it's symmetric. But if the PMF looked like that, what we would be dragging would be the flipped version of the PDF. This is not super important unless you're an electrical engineering major and they're going to torture you with this. Not super important. What I do want you to think about is about the effect of doing this, which essentially is going to be to notice that here we're going to like this is going to be equal to zero when they don't overlap. When they start overlapping, it's going to look like this. And when they stop overlapping, it's going to go to zero again like that. Okay, we're going to get some kind of triangular PDF. Um, and this is a bit of a spoiler alert because I'm going to show you a better picture in a moment, but I just want to start like I want I want you to focus on the fact that we're kind of smoothing out one of the PDFs by doing kind of a weighted average um, with the other PDF on top. Okay, so I hope my terrible drawings helped in some way. And now let's let's continue with the math. Okay, so what happens if zero is between if s is between zero and um, and one, then basically this um, this product is non-zero between zero and s, okay? Because we have these two conditions. And in that case, when we integrate from zero to s, we're just integrating one, the uh, convolution is going to be equal to s. If s is between one and two, then we're convolving from s minus one to one. Uh, sorry, we're integrating from s minus one to one, so it's two minus s, as I think I said correctly a moment ago. Okay, what happens if s is more than zero or s is greater than two? Then this is equal to zero. Again, I hope this explanation was more or less clear. You should try just to compute this on your own to convince yourself. So now I am, um, oh, and now, by the way, we're interested in the purchased. I was, I just wanted to look at the pictures, but we have to remember that we're interested in the purchased coffee. So we're actually um, dividing the sum by the number of suppliers, in this case by two. Again, let's to derive the um, um, a PDF, we start by the CDF. What is the CDF of the purchased coffee, which is the mean of the two first suppliers? Well, it's the probability that that random variable is smaller or equal to this constant m. Now we express it in terms of s2 because we just derived the PDF of s2. This is the probability that s2 divided by 2 is smaller or equal to m. That's just the probability that s2 is smaller than 2m. It's the CDF of s2 at 2m. And now when we differentiate this, what happens? The 2 comes out and we differentiate the CDF into a PDF. Okay, so the PDF of this guy is going to be 2 times the PDF of s. We plug in 2m and that gives us 4m between 0 and 1 half and 4 times 1 minus m between 1 half and 1. So basically, the general shape doesn't change. We're just kind of like, um, you know, so basically, this eff the effect of a dividing by 2 basically compresses. So the sum is going to be, uh, to have a certain value, we're going to compress it to be between 0 and 1. Hopefully, I don't know, <laughs> maybe that confused you more than anything. Um, but yeah, so, so hopefully that makes sense. So the, the sum is going to be between 0 and 2. The average is going to be between 0 and 1. That, that was my point. Okay, and 0 otherwise. Let's take a look at the picture. Here, uh, one supplier is um, uniform between 0 and 1. When we have two suppliers, we have this triangular um, function that comes because of this sh shifting of one of the PDFs on top of the other. We have, when we have n suppliers, the sum is equal to the convolution of the n suppliers. We can repeat the same argument that we did with CDFs to show that the, um, the, the PDF of the average is just going to be n times the PDF of the sum where we multiply n times m. 
So I hope the intuition is okay, but like between like the sum is going to kind of be between zero and n, but then we divide by n, so have to kind of like we have an average that is between zero and one. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so this is the expression. We're gonna convolve all the individual PDFs and then uh, we do this transformation that maps it back to between zero and one because we're dividing by n. What's the result? Again, I, I recommend that you go through the operations on your own so that they make sense. But what is the result? One supplier, two suppliers, and now we continue convolving and we keep things between zero and one. And what we see is that things become very Gaussian-like. These are just six suppliers. So very quickly, things look very Gaussian. Again, let's overlay a Gaussian that has the same mean and the same variance with uh, this average. What is the mean of the average? Well, by linearity of expectation is the average of the means. In this case, this is a uniform random variable between 0 and 1. Uh, the mean is 0 0.5. So this average is uh, 0 0.5, okay, because they all have the same mean. What is the variance of the sum? Now this guy comes out squared. So it's 1 over n squared times the sum of the variances. The variance of a uniform random variable between 0 and 1 is 1 over 12. So this is equal to 1 over 12 divided by n. Notice this effect where the variance is going down with n, which we talked about a lot uh, when we talked about the law of large numbers. Okay, so this is what the Gaussian approximation looks like for two suppliers. Three, four, five, and already for six suppliers, it's really, really good. Again, I also want you to, well, I want you to notice two things. First, that this smooth like basically these moving averages which are a, what we which we call a convolution smooth out the pdf so that they look gaussian like and that this actually happens really really quickly which again justifies why we apply these gaussian approximations even though the central limit theorem only talks about the limit as we will see when we talk about the central limit theorem in a following video all right so we've been mentioning gaussians I think it, it's a good point to kind of take a look at what happens if we actually sum two Gaussians. So we're going to ask ourselves what is the PDF of the sum of A and B when A and B are independent standard Gaussians that have zero mean and unit variance. What is the PDF of the sum going to be equal to? It's just the convolution of the, the PDFs of the Gaussians because they are independent. So now we plug in the Gaussian PDF. Remember that we're assuming zero mean and unit variance. You can apply exactly the same argument for non-zero mean, like random uh, Gau for Gaussians that have arbitrary means and variances. It's just that it gets very clumped and like more complicated. The argument is the same, but the notation becomes a bit of a nightmare. So to make things easy, I just we're just going to prove it for zero mean and unit variance, but the argument is the same. Okay, so now we have product of two exponentials, that's the exponential of the sum of them. And now what we're going to do is we're going to expand this guy and we're going to try to transform this into a minus something squared. We'll see why in a moment. Okay, so we expand this and now we realize that we have a squared, um, if, we if we take the minus out, this is a squared plus a s plus something. If that something were s squared divided by 4, I believe. I hope I'm not saying, saying something silly. Then we would have a minus s squared. So hopefully you see that this, well, you see, you can compute that this is actually equal to this. I just want to tell you the logic. The logic is that I'm trying to group a with something that is squared so that I can separate these guys and get Gaussian's PDFs out of it. This, is, this trick is called completing the square. So you can check on your own that this makes sense. This term comes from correcting for the fact that we want to express this guy as a minus something squared. Why do we want to do that? Because now that we have expressed these things in this way, we can again separate the exponentials and take out this guy completely. Now I'm going to uh, have this constant sigma squared that is equal to two, just to show, like, just to make very clear that when I separate this again, notice that we have joined the two square root of two pi into two pi, and now we're separating them again. And here I have sigma and one over sigma, which obviously multiply to one. This sigma, is equal, this sigma squared is equal to two because we have a four here. Why is that important? 
because well, you'll see in a moment why that is important. Uh, but we get this expression outside that is clearly a Gaussian PDF. And critically, we also get an expression inside that is a Gaussian PDF. Why is this important? Because we're integrating a Gaussian PDF from minus infinity to infinity. So this guy is just equal to one. Okay. This is why it was so important to get a minus something squared here, because we're integrating with respect to a, and that will allow us to integrate things out. Okay. So because that is equal to one, we end up with this situation where the PDF is just a Gaussian with zero mean and variance equal to two. So the sum of the individual variances of the Gaussian random variables. So it turns out that when we convolve to Gaussians, things remain Gaussian. And it seems from uh, what we've seen every, like for normal, like other PDFs and other PMFs, when they get convolved with each other, they tend to look Gaussian-like. Once they look Gaussian-like by this result, if they're sufficiently Gaussian, they're going to stay Gaussian because when we convolve to Gaussians, they stay Gaussian. That's the significance of this result here. Again, as I said a moment ago, you could follow with this, like you could follow exactly the same argument to show that if you have a Gaussian A1 and a Gaussian A2 with mean mu1 and mu2, and variance in sigma1 squared and sigma2 squared, uh, the sum of A1 and A2 is going to be Gaussian with a mean that is equal to the sum of the means and a variance that is equal to the sum of the variances. All right, so what have we learned? We have learned what is the distribution of the sums and averages of independent random variables. The distributions are obtained by convolving either the probability mass functions or the probability density functions. We have seen that that convolution smooths things out so that this, uh, the distribution actually tends to be Gaussian-like really quickly. And we've also seen that if we have the sum of Gauss independent Gaussian random variables, then the sum is also going to be Gaussian which uh, connects to the fact that when we do this convolution operator, it seems that things want to either become Gaussian-like or stay Gaussian-like. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.